All right, good afternoon. Uh, I hope everybody enjoyed their lunch. Uh, we are gonna go ahead and kick it off with the next set of exciting panels. I'm especially excited about this one, but um, since everybody's just coming back from lunch, you know, I feel like I have to tell a space-related dad joke to really awesome. be back in the crowd, right? Love Always up for Everybody that. loves nice. dad jokes, right? So, why are astronauts never hungry when they get to orbit? Why? Because they just had a big launch. Oh my God. <laughs> nice. I've been here all day. Woo! Wow. All right, with that, I am Duncan Miller. I am a first year SDM student and on the leadership team in the Sloan Space Industry Club. And I'm here to introduce the Commercial LEO Destinations panel. This panel will focus on the future of the uh, of LEO without the ISS and the role that private industry plays in that transition. So for our speakers, start down here uh, with Ms. Sita Somti. Uh, she is partner and associate director of aerospace and defense at BCG. We've got Ms. Solange Massa. She is founder and CEO of EcoAtoms. And then we have Ariel Ekblaw who is founder and director of MIT's Space Exploration Initiative and founder and CEO of the Aurelia Institute. And then we have uh, Virgil Hutchinson, who is the Space Systems Chief Engineering Director at Northrop Grumman. And lastly, we have Mr. Matt Weinzerl, uh, who is Senior Associate Dean at some small school up the river. Uh, <laughs> the panel will run for 40 minutes with five minutes left for questions. Turn over to you, Matt. Thank Great. you. Great. Thank you so much, Duncan. And thank you for setting the bar low with that joke. That's a good <laughs> start. Um, all right. We are thrilled uh, to have this panel. Thank you all for joining us. What an incredible group. I just want to congratulate Duncan and the team on this panel, because it really is an amazing group of experts to share their insights with us today. Uh, we only have 40 minutes, so we're going to hit the ground running. Duncan gave you just the briefest of introductions, and I wanted to give our panelists a bit of a chance to say a bit more about who they are, so you know, for afterwards. So can we start at the end there, Sita? Can you just give us a brief one-minute intro to yourself? Uh, before running the uh, commercial space topic at Boston Consulting Group globally for about the last two years, I was head of human space flight sales at SpaceX um, and actually drafted the first private astronaut mission Space Act Agreement with NASA. I'm very excited about that. Um, and happened to have done a few due diligences on commercial, on a NASA CLD winners. So we can dive into some of the statistics a little bit later. Oh, and I'm a single mom to two amazing teenagers who play basketball, most importantly. <laughs> awesome. Let's start by the important things, exactly. right? I'm a mom of two, right? right. <laughs> Little kids, very nice. Uh, I'm the CEO and founder of EcoAtoms. And what we're trying to do is really um, generate science in bigger quantities, right? In bigger payloads where the end, where the number of experiments can actually yield products, right? In the biomedical, pharmaceutical industry and moving into other industries. And we fundamentally believe that with this space um, economy growing, these payloads need to be bigger and this science needs to be more reproducible. So learning from the ISS and trying to take that at a bigger scale for uh, the creation of products. Right. Hi, everyone. I'm Ariel Ekblaw. I did my PhD here at MIT in self-assembling robotic systems for space. You'll hear a little bit more about that later when we get to some questions on the panel. But the idea of this project and then a lab that I founded around that research at MIT, I've now run that space exploration initiative for seven years, was to build the infrastructure, the shells in orbit that can ensconce our spacefaring species, but also build all of the artifacts of our future science fiction, future, our future life in space, and profoundly democratize access to that ecosystem. And to do that, after seven years at MIT, running a lab and doing my PhD, I've now spun out a new startup, which is a hybrid nonprofit incubator and a VC fund to scale human presence in orbit. So we're really focused on life in space technologies and life in space ecosystems. It's great to be here with you today. Thanks. Nice. Hey everybody, I'm Virgil Hutchinson. I'm a, um, yeah, my title is Chief Engineering Director at Northrop Grumman, so part of my job, is, along with our engineering VP, is to be the technical oversight um, and connection for all things space within our company. Um, but really, I'm just a build design, or design, build, and fly guy. 
Um, I started my career out working with the Constellation program, so I got my first time to actually fly something when we flew the Orion Launch Abort System, May 10th, 2010. Um, and then since then, I've been able to be on some great projects, a lot of them human spaceflight related, um, including the Antares launch vehicle, the Cygnus spacecraft, which you guys know delivers cargo to the International Space Station. And I was part, um, kind of part of the leadership leading what we now have within the company is the, uh, the Habitation and Logistics Outpost, which is the actual crew um, habitation module on the NASA Lunar Gateway Space Station, which is gonna be a key part of the Artemis mission. Um, I would just say I'm really excited about the opportunity to be here and to talk about this particular topic. Um, let's just say LEO destinations is a big thing we do, a big thing I've been interested in for years, and it's not a lot of opportunities you get to actually talk about it, so thanks for having me. Excellent, thank you all very much. Uh, briefly, I'm Matt Weinsroll. I have a 13-year-old daughter who I try to brainwash with space enthusiasm at all chances I get. Uh, and I'm a tax a theorist by training, of all things, but I found space about a decade ago and I've been trying to research it and now teach about it. And in fact, a few of you are gonna be in my course down the river at HBS starting next week. So we're really excited to start on that. I hope you were as excited as I was by the complementarity in their different backgrounds with related to commercial stations. I think this is, a, again, a really beautifully assembled panel. When I think about what panels are useful for, we can all read about commercial stations, right? We can all read about the CLD program. But we now have four people in the midst of this sector, and we can hear from them firsthand stuff that you can't read. Uh, and so in particular, I'd love to start us with this question, which is, I think, one of the lingering questions that has been floating around this sector for a long time. Many of you know, stations have been an exciting idea for 50 years. <laughs> uh, and many, many articles have been written about their potential. And yet, if you look at the demand for the ISS, or even the latent demand, it seems, there is for commercial stations, it's not exactly overwhelming. Right, so where is that demand really gonna come from? And deeper down, where is the value generation on station really gonna happen? So I thought each of our panelists could take a little bit of time giving us an example of where, how they really think we can generate value on these commercial stations. Okay, so we started with CETA in the first question. Let's start on this end this first time. Virgil, let's start us out. Okay, so I, I will say that um, having, currently being involved in some of the NASA CLD stuff, there's, there's a limited amount that I could say about that. So I said my disclosure statement and I'm good. Um, but I, I will tell you about other things that we've done, which you know, those are things that I think are really important to drive in value to the customer when it comes to commercial space. And I would say I've been involved, you know, I would say North Grumman has been involved decades with the commercial um, communication satellite market, which you know is heavily international. You know, you think of direct TV, all those kind of things, that's a huge commercial market all over the place. And what we try to do is bring that commercial market to what we're doing with, with our ISS. So with the, if you're familiar with it, the Cygnus program that we've been using for delivering cargo, that is commercial. It is one of the commercial incubators with NASA that has actually turned out to be working really well. Um, but the thing that you don't know or may not know is that with every one of our, or most of our Cygnus missions, Yes, we deliver cargo to the space station, we take away waste, but it's that time between when we leave the space station and when we re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, there's a whole lot of things that happen. I, you know, for starters, we leave and we start you know, deploying all types of CubeSats all over the place, and we've been doing that for years now. And so that gives an opportunity for universities, for some commercial areas, to get their space into orbit. And then after we deliver those CubeSats into orbit, we could spend up to a year in space doing all kinds of science things for different customers who are interested. And so that's where I think really the drive is, is with you know, looking at the next phase of LEO space stations is getting more access to customers you know, reliably and at a low cost. Because if you think about that particular scenario I just walked through, which is what we do, the cost is really just for those different payloads, those different instruments, those different science areas, just to have to qualify their stuff to get onto our vehicle. So they don't have to worry about the rocket, they don't have to worry about all the logistics. We'll handle that. It's more about giving you the opportunity to do your science. And to me, that's the key thing here. Great, thanks Virgil. Sure. 
So I think about this in at least four categories. There are probably more. And if you remember the birth of the internet, the things that we would have imagined were possible before the internet became so prevalent, you know, pales in comparison to what we actually have now. So at least four things up front that we know are possible to bring value to those customers in orbit. One is basic science, right? So we already do have business flowing through NASA, academics um, paying money to be able to go up and do basic science and discovery. How does combustion work in orbit? What's happening to the human body in orbit? Second category would be technology maturation. So we want to send a nanopore sequencer to Mars. We need to make sure it works in gravity first or that it survives launch loads. We'll take it up to space and pay for that. The third category would be manufactured items, whether physical, additive manufacturing, biology, proteins, that can be made in a really unique way in a microgravity environment in space and sold back down to an Earth-based, much larger addressable market. Uh, so just wanted to give a shout out to Nicole Wagner, for example. She's around MIT this weekend producing artificial retinas in orbit, so pure, so clean, such good substrates that couldn't be done on Earth and going to be able to solve macular degeneration here on the surface. Fourth category, which I think is what gets people really excited, in addition to how exciting the other three are, is space for the sake of space and space tourism or experiences in space. And so that is a category that I think is still the most emerging, the most open-ended about how the business cases close. But we have at least those four, and that does signify a significant market opportunity in LEO. And just to answer your question about how we're supporting that, or really in particular, we support that in two ways. One is with infrastructure. So our focus is on novel R&D that would build space habitats, volumes in space, way bigger than your biggest rocket payload fairing. So instead of building a prefabbed module that has to fit within a particular space, imagine a modular stack of tiles in a glorified PEZ dispenser. You open up that rocket in orbit, that payload fairing opens, those tiles self-assemble into a really large volume, and that's what's going to enable us to do things like take the semiconductor industry to orbit and get better quality crystals and chips, take the protein folding industry to orbit and actually finally do what NASA has been selling for so long. Um, so that's one way, it's infrastructure, and we're doing novel R&D for next generation infrastructure. And then the second thing is biz dev. I wouldn't have called it this within my academic lab, but we are essentially showing artists, biologists, architects, all kinds of people with different backgrounds at MIT how to go out and fundraise, buy your own payload, not wait and go through a NASA grant, and show them that they all have a role and a place in the future of space exploration. And that is seeding tons of different minds and startups and companies that we are now also investing in with our ecosystem to actually produce the customers for these space stations to succeed. That's great. Uh, Solange, just before you jump in, I just yeah. want, so I'm hearing from both of you, I think, more reliable, lower cost, access is the key. And I'm hearing from you, larger capacity, more functionality. Those are both supply, <laughs> right? Those are both like, I'm going to push down the cost. I'm going to let make it easier and cheaper. And maybe that's enough. Mm -hmm. But I, one of the tensions, I guess, is do you feel people knocking at your door saying, yes, that's what I want? Or do, are we going to have to generate it, right? Where's the demand as an economist, right? That's all I can think about, supply and demand. So, um, but we'll, we'll get to that some more. But Solange, I wanted you to jump yeah, in. Yeah, I, I was going to ROI. So I was, <laughs> <laughs> I was getting into that. So uh, what you both said, it's phenomenal. That's, it's 100% true. I'm not going to reiterate on the industries just, just said, right? But I think um, talking about two things here, like price per gram of what you produce, it's a very important thing, right? We are focused on industries like pharmaceutical, medical devices where price per gram of production in space might make sense. So we are at a very interesting time where there's a transition time between space station, right, that was a political um, <laughs> structure at the beginning, then that shifted into a research kind of place now they're trying to make it manufacturing, but as you well know, in basis of design, right, you need to design to manufacture and to manufacture efficiently and to make that um, product under good manufacturing practices. So we are working with, with several CLDs saying, hey, it's phenomenal if you want to do filmmaking and have Tom Cruise fly around. That's phenomenal. <laughs> 
but I'm not sure I want that or the taco, floating taco, in front of our production wing, right? So it is important that we are now trying to design our own payloads, right, in a scalable way together with CLDs that are gonna be our, our real estate, right? We're gonna be renting those spots and, and the cars and the parking spots need to be designed for manufacturing purposes, right? So I think those two uh, things are important. Now we're trying to design towards these um, end goals and different industries, and we can actually have the luxury of maybe separating them <laughs> module to module or another industry that is phenomenal. We're not, I don't know if we're gonna talk about them too, but there's, a, there's at least 15 capsule companies, right, uh, that are gonna be orbiting and um, Maybe they're going to be in this interaction with, with the space stations, we don't know, but it's uh, suborbital, it's orbital with capsules and space stations, right? So all of this economy is um, unfolding, and we need to be responsible for trying to transition that R&D uh, from the space station that was great, phenomenal, but now those need to become products. <laughs> the ROI needs to make sense. We need to manufacture in a way that if you're doing a human product, great. Have you heard about the FDA? There's a lot of agencies that will be regulating your product. So designing towards that. Great. Thanks. Sita? So just as you weren't allowed to talk too much into the north of the, I can't say anything about Tom Cruise. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> but what I can say is Tom Cruise is a non-trivial contributor to the R&D funding that is actually going to represent the demand for all of the supply. Um, and I, I think it's worth noting that since you're talking about demand, and I know we'll eventually maybe get into this in a bit more depth, I'll take that opportunity right now. Part of what we do is due diligence, which is essentially assessing the business model of existing winners of, let's say, CLD, no offense. Um, but let's also take, uh, take the often discussed TAM for manufacturing semiconductor chips in orbit. Why are we assuming that's even going to happen? And unpacking the assumptions behind that jump from here to there is what we have done. We've done this on a disaggregated basis based on what are, I would say, 10 of the most cited use cases for that expectation for growth in commercial LEO destinations and maybe beyond. But then we actually go back to the suppliers, and, or I should say the prospective customers of the service, and say, what would you have to believe to be willing to invest the R&D to get up there? And you know what a lot of them say? A lot of them say, well, at the end of the day, it's about our individual industry's metric. It's not about just, what it is, just the cost of manufacturing semiconductor chips, because they've gotten that down to not just a science, but like cheaper than PEZ, OK? <laughs> but then, I mean, talk about the trade imbalance between the United States and Taiwan. There's a reason that's such a, a hot topic for the Department of Commerce. But then when you aggregate that and demand this jump to orbit, it's also about who they're selling to. And is there some way that they can convey as a semiconductor chip manufacturer to the manufacturer of a smartphone, I'm gonna make you manufacturing that smartphone cheaper by sending it up to orbit. That is probably 20 steps removed, but those are the must believes that you would have to click just for that one segment to unlock the TAM that can fuel the supply, et cetera. There's a second category of must believes that I don't want to skip over, and it is sort of the Tom Cruise question, and it hits close to home, especially given, I would say, my honor in being involved in the sale of Inspiration4. If anyone has seen the show on Netflix, or if you haven't, I'm in it. My kids love that. Um, <laughs> but it's actually getting early adopters, not just at the industrial level, but actually at the ultra high net worth individual level, to believe. And guess what? They're gonna believe before the corporations. So let's not discount, Ariel, you made a great point. Space tourism is going to be such an anchor source of both the customer base for the space as a service so-called model, both by existing NASA CLD, but also the startup ecosystem that's building around it. But they're also going to be, and should be rightfully treated as investors, which is why I say eventually we will all thank Tom Cruise. That's awesome. <laughs> so can I ask just, we should move on to our next big question, but just can you guys talk to each other about this a little bit? So Sita, at first I felt like you were moving towards a lot of skepticism, pessimism of the business case, but then you gave us this silver lining where you said the, right, the early adopters can get us in the door and maybe that's what we need. 
panel, please react. I wanted to echo what Sita was saying, which is the high net worth individuals are still really key in this industry. And people often ask, how did the MIT Space Exploration Initiative do 100 payloads in the last seven years between microgravity flights, zero-G, ISS, and the moon? And the type of fundraising that I had to do to pull that off was high net worth individuals, philanthropy, and some corporates. And so I think that they are still a really important part of that ecosystem and getting people excited and being able to, to succeed with that. And then I think you two had an interesting uh, exchange a bit. There's the price model where companies are trying to say, can I sell something that's better and will it actually be cheaper by going to space? I think the cheaper aspect might be still a ways off, but the better aspect for things mm -hmm. like biology is here. There are so many things that could only be done in microgravity that that might be one of those commercial niches to be able to really hit on. So. Can I respond and say I completely agree because I've seen in some of our um, breaking apart those 10 use cases, biotech is by far yes. the greatest. It is assumed that there will be That's scalable right. mass manufacturing of 3D printed human organs or specifically eyeballs that can then ultimately be brought back down to earth that can't occur on earth because of gravity. So you're spot on about that. It's exciting to see. It is really exciting to see. It is interesting too, if you look at the history of in excitement about this stuff, the rise of the bio sector in the past, whatever, five, 10 years has been really dramatic. I mean, right, uh, if you think about made in space, they were you know, wrenches or other sorts of more concrete things, I guess you'd say, but this is really an exciting new development. It's the hot thing that we talk about. Okay, great. This is a great segue actually into the second big question I was hoping that this panel could talk to us all about, which is, sort of their most unconventional view about stations, right? There's conventional wisdom out there, but we've got folks in front of us who can tell us something that might challenge the way you think about them. So why don't we do that? Now, let's see, we started at both ends. Let's start in the middle. Solange, can I start with you? What's you or your company's most First, First, um, I think our most conventional, like unconventional view of this is when people go small, we go big. We believe that master orbit, it's gonna be a lot cheaper. So when people are taking experiments the size of a phone, uh, we say no, we wanna take a microwave minimum, uh, 500 samples, like do it the way pharmaceutical companies do it, right? Because when you go and talk to them, right? We, we, talk, we talked about believers, right? There are some industries that do not believe, trust me, you have to be in that room, right? Um, and you need to tell them that this is risky R&D. That's exactly what it is. It's at, at the edge of innovation. And the investment there is, of course, risky. We do not know what is going to happen, especially when you take micro experiments in the ISS, trust the science, and say, hey, you know what? I'm going to do 100 of those to see that science is actually true. Can that become a product? So I think our most unconventional uh, way of seeing space is when people go small, we go big. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. Ariel, you want to go next? Sure. Uh, so there's often a trade-off between are we investing in settlements, uh, you know, future space civilizations on the surface of celestial bodies, space stations on the moon or Mars, or in orbit? And I am a huge Jerry O'Neill girl. I think we should <laughs> be pushing that, not to the exclusion of you know, focusing on the surface of the moon and Mars, but Mars is not where humanity wants to live long-term. Perchlorates in the soil, one-third G. We have no idea if a human woman can bring a baby to term in one-third G, so we don't really know if we can have a long-term human civilization on the surface of Mars, but we do know that we could do that in orbit if we get artificial gravity going. And so being able to actually build the Jerry O'Neill scale vision of spinning space habitats in orbit, you can get yourself Martian G, you can get yourself Lunar G, you can get yourself 1G and keep humans alive and much healthier if we're able to begin spinning space habitats. So that's my hot take. That's a hot take, I love it. Okay, uh, Virgil, you wanna take it? Yeah, so, so a couple of things for me. So the first is, I would say the big thing is international partnerships. Um, I say it because I, we've talked a lot today and in the multiple discussions that happened before now, there's been a discussion on you know, vertical integration, which I'm a big fan of vertical integration and horizontal integration, but I would say the big thing we've seen over the years is you know, we've built a strong international relationship as we've developed our, I would say, station-like capabilities over the last 15 years, and that's played to our benefit because it's not just us taking on the risk and taking on the abilities because the thing is, yes, we can think of some cool technology, but there are others who are thinking of something different and then when those things start working together, that's when you start to see a lot of successes. So the fact that with on Cyg within Cygnus, you know, pressurized module built in Italy, the sensors are in 
Canada and Germany. The you know, a lot parts of the propulsion are out of Japan. So there's a strong international partnership there. The other big thing is we've we've taken an evolutionary approach. And I know we've talked about you know, how we should invest and go out there and take that, you know, that huge step. And I would say for us, it's been um, let's take it baby steps at a time so that we can encourage the market with those successes so they will be willing to invest heavily. Um, it kind of so I'm not getting myself in trouble, I'm going to jump from Leo to Geo. Mm -hmm. So, and I was talking to somebody about this earlier. So, if you're not sure, Geo com uh, communication satellites usually last about 15 years. Um, so that means every 15 years, these you know big you know broadcast companies pay a big amount of money, a few hundred million dollars, to put another one up there. What we learned, both from our work doing robotic um, ground demonstrations for assembly in orbit, and from some other things, that hey, maybe going after the market of providing in space servicing for those 15-year birds, which generate billions of dollars for their companies. But you know, if there's a way to continue having them with their spacecraft operating for maybe another four or five years, that in turn allows those companies to have a lot more revenue before having to put a new asset in place. And in turn, it allows us to build up our capability to do the servicing, the logistics, the things that are needed to support a space station. So we've taken the approach of, yes, we may not be the space station Builder right now, we may not be the ones, you know, the government is the ones driving ISS right now, but that's not us. But we can do all the logistics for you because we can deliver your cargo like FedEx. We can take your trash like waste management. We can do your maintenance when it's like, a, oh, something's going on. Like right now, we're the ones reboosting the space station. We're the ones connecting to the geo spacecraft in orbit. So as we start to build up those capabilities, that gives of investors' confidence. So when I go to them and say, I want to put a robotic arm on another spacecraft and start servicing, they say, here you go. You've shown us that you can do that. I have no problem giving you that investment you want. That's a super interesting tension that just formed here between the sort of incrementalist approach and like the big bang approach to the future of stations, which we might all think about. But Sita, <laughs> you want to jump in? Hopefully the future stations won't experience a big bang. Sorry, wrong term. <laughs> <laughs> No, uh, so three things come to mind when you, framing the question of what's sort of an unconventional perspective on future commercial LEO. One, one, com, one comes to mind is a use case that I had to study about um, before speaking before a, uh, a French client. L'Oreal had invested a significant amount of R&D in developing a particular kind of camera to be able to not only take pictures, Earth, it's essentially an Earth observation capability from the ISS, which is where it was deployed and tested, but then somehow they leveraged similar capability, don't ask me how because I didn't work at L'Oreal, to assess skin tone for women. The point of it being our R&D is going to fuel maybe this Earth observation capability to detect the difference in color schemes, but it's going to actually drive value for how we develop foundation for women, right, across the racial value chain, let's call it, here on Earth. That sort of thing is actually going to fuel revenue more than semiconductor chips. You heard it here first. <laughs> Second unconventional point. We're talking about talk the tension of like incrementalist growth versus hopefully not a big bang, but significant overwhelming growth. This is less of an unconventional point. It's more of an Eeyore, but space debris mitigation, space traffic management, those regulatory systems, they're evolving very slowly. And the EOR perspective is they're evolving too slowly to prevent the kind of outcome that is going to actually cause a big bang. And that's directly going to implicate the growth trajectories for everybody in this ecosystem. So it's something that if only some of us, I mean, I know we're all sort of paying attention to, but I think it's something that we can all as a collective agree upon that there are problems that need to be solved or at least norms established immediately, if not sooner, to preserve the prospect of growth, be it incremental or exponential. And the third piece is the largest source of revenue drivers in the future and investment drivers today for the next five years, and this, by the way, is not an unconventional opinion. This is actually the result of the um, assessment work that we recently did. They're not going to come from America. Industrial 
or um, space agencies. It's all going to come from overseas. And so we're actually going to eventually experience a space trade imbalance, food for thought. Can you say more about that part? Well, I, can, I can't say who, but I think we can all do enough Google that.com to assess who are the major competitors in the space domain, not just from a war fighting perspective, but more importantly from a, from a space commerce perspective. There are other sources of international space stations, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> the People's Republic of. Um, but setting, <laughs> setting that aside, what's interesting to me is you have, I think, 72 new space agencies were established in the last five years. Think about that staggering statistic. Those aren't just random organizations that just manifested into being. They needed budgets. They're working on what their objectives are and what they're going to do with that money. And you better believe a lot of that is in response to this perceived growth of commercial LEO as the future ecosystem for economic development and GDP growth. So if you see those space agencies coming online, they're also going to be talking to their industrial counterparts and their trade partners and say, why don't we try to do some of this in space, create a flagship program, put some R&D money behind it, fuel the investment, and the rest of the story is told. Yeah, and I was gonna see that, I, I totally agree with you, and I would even say if you were to look to, and this goes to what I've seen, with the commercial communication satellite market, it is highly international. I would say majority of the uh, majority of the customers we have right now with Northern Grumman regarding geocommunication satellites are international. I mean, we're launching them for UAE, for Thailand, for for France, for many different co co countries. You know, multiple times a year. So it's one of those where it's like if we saw it there, of course it's going to happen with Leo. It totally makes sense. Anybody else want to react to any of the other unconventional views they heard on the panel? I just want to say, Ariel, I had never even thought about bringing a child to term in orbit until you just mentioned it. And I, having <laughs> made two children, like I should be thinking about that sort of thing. There's a program in Singapore that is looking into that. There's one researcher. I talked to him when I was in Singapore um, the other month. So we are already discussing uh, medical devices in orbit, right? What happens if somebody has a heart attack? What happens if surgery, right? I, I had a meeting, very interesting meeting yesterday here um, at uh, HST, right? Um, talking about these materials that when you use a certain band-aid or something on Earth or when you're depositing something on Earth, of course, you're gonna think that gravity is gonna do its job, right? But if you have a wound and that needs feeling, like how do we change that material to make it skin adhesive, right? Um, yeah. Can I ask a provocative question? So Jeremy Grummet was going to be on the yeah, Grimmett, sorry, was going to be on the panel today. Is Jeremy in the audience? Okay, so Jeremy's from, he was on a panel this morning. He's from Rogue Space, which builds robots, orbital robots. And one question I think is what role humans are actually going to play in commercial stations. What are humans going to What role are humans going to play versus robots? And I know Ariel she wants the O'Neill cylinders full of people <laughs> having babies, so that's great. Been made only by robots. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, what do we, as you, as the panel looks forward, what is the role of humans relative to autonomous um, on stations? Oh, I've got an answer. All right. Uh, our role will be to establish the laws, governance, ethics, norms, and cultural and religious and gender-based. I guess norms, essentially, um, the structure that will enable any of this activity to be conducted that is as representative as the best practices of what we do here on Earth. And I would say as the best practices, because hopefully we don't make the same mistakes up there. Right, right. I think our job as humans will just be to enjoy it and design it in a way that it becomes a life worth living in orbit. Awesome. Right now, you see the inside of the International Space Station, and to me, it looks quite exciting. It looks like a science lab. I'm happy to live in a science lab, but not everybody is happy right. to live <laughs> in a science lab. And so if we really do want to continue the rate of exploration, whether it be completely robotic probes to Europa or elsewhere, we do need to, I think, satiate that human desire for exploration and to be part of it, and it needs to be a life worth living in space or a life worth part-time working in space, and that means we have to think about human-centered design for space habitats, moving beyond the survival paradigm, which NASA and so many other partners have done so well, and on whose shoulders we stand, into a thriving paradigm for these ecosystems of space habitats. 
Talk about remote working, huh? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I totally agree with that approach. And, and I don't know if people know how busy astronauts are on their day-to-day -day basis on operations, right? They have super long days. So am I going to add a science experiment to that? Not really. They're really trying, working very hard to maintain that space station going and healthy, right? So in our case, we do believe that if we want to do manufacturing, there's a part that's going to be automated, right? for enjoyment, for um, maintenance, right, from the astronauts. And then um, it's Dorit uh, Norville here. Well, um, yeah, we were talking about this the other day. So um, then there's going to be different types of humans, hopefully, not just uh, pilots, right? We're hoping we get um, scientists that are also doctors, right? So when everything is nominal, they might be doing experiments, but if something goes wrong, then the doctor part activates. And then uh, the pilot is going to be in charge of the station, and then you're going to have an actor or an actress uh, floating around and filming, right? Um, so we hope for different um, humans in space, right? Yeah. Lots of humans in space, Virgil. Yeah, and I would say, because when you mentioned, you know, that astronauts work really hard on the space station, I, I totally agree, and it makes me think of, you know, the times because we get you know the live feeds at um, in our mission control center of astronauts sleeping in our modules because it's like nice and quiet because everything is so loud in the ISS because it's just think of yourself being in a tin can with all kinds of random machines going all day long and you just want a quiet place to take a nap. Um, so sorry, it just made me think of that. Um, but with regards to, to humans versus autonomous, I would say right now with the way we connect with station, a lot of it is autonomous. And a lot of it is, you know, I would say there are some who are like, oh, you don't want a person doing that. It's, no, it's more of being able to build in that redundancy for safety so that if something happens, you have something that automatically either says, get me away from here until I can figure something out, or says, oh, no, I know what to do here. I'm going to, you know, close these, you know, things, inhibit this, and start this control so we can safely move on to the next step. So that's why I think it's as far as the logistics and operations, I, I think a lot of that should be autonomous. Mm -hmm. Um, but then when it comes to humans, I, I will tell you, I've thought about this over the last few days, and it you know, I keep thinking about um, how we have people going into Antarctica. You know, there are no hotels in Antarctica. You know, some people go and they sit on a boat, and they stay on the boat, and they look out, or they may take a ferry over and walk on the, you know, walk on the ice for maybe 30 minutes. But that's it. And so the question is, and I would say that currently within our space station, that's been our mindset. We do science inside the boat, and occasionally we'll go outside to clean the window or fix something. <laughs> so the question is, if we're going to have humans in space, what are they going to do? Are they going to enjoy themselves? Are they going to take a cruise around the moon? Are they going to, you know, it's like you want them to have these excursions, being able to enjoy themselves and enjoy space. So if that's what we want people to do, then believe it or not, we need to start rethinking how we're doing space stations. That's great. One quick add-on, Crew Dragon would not have flown and we would not have gotten the approvals for the private astronaut mission for Inspiration4 were it not for the fact that all of the systems on Crew Dragon are automated already. Mm -hmm. So we were supposed to end at 12.25, but my Oscar clock says I have four minutes left down here. So <laughs> we have a couple of minutes for Q&A from the audience. Yes, right in the middle. You, you. Uh, okay, so oh. first of all, I got future shock from the expression orbital eyeball factory. <laughs> on dreams tonight. I'm excited for that. And then the second thing is um, a theme that keeps coming up is payload mass is a limiting factor for the kinds of operations that can happen. And obviously, that would be alleviated by the possibility of using resources that are already up there. Um, to what extent is the accessibility of space-based resources factoring into long-term plans or consulting strategies? Uh, do we assume that lunar water or propellant is going to be accessible? Do we assume that asteroid-based ore is going to be accessible anytime in the near enough future that it's a practical part of your plan? Thank you. I guess I'll take that first. Okay. Um, the first thing I'll offer is payload, when we say payload mass, the real question is, are we talking about payload up to orbit or payload back down? I think when we think about the value of commercial LEO destinations as an ecosystem, as an economic driver, it's the payload back down that matters. It's what we're bringing back here to serve other communities on Earth who can't actually get themselves up and back. That payload back down, 
I'll just offer the next 10 years, we know all of the major transportation vehicles. In fact, we can thank our friends at Northrop Grumman for a critical one in Cygnus. <laughs> The next generation of successful mass back down, though, is something that doesn't burn up on reentry. <laughs> and so that's where we're actually putting our money as an industry, really. I mean, I don't think it's just us. I think it's all providers that are looking at how do we successfully deorbit payload mass so that we can actually deliver the goods of scientific research, so we can deliver the goods of mass manufacturing of the eyeballs eventually, um, and that kind of application. Your question is spot on, but I, I will just confess, I think that refers to a decade out even further. Because successfully mining things like lunar regolith or lunar water and applying them towards mechanisms for in-orbit transportation, for in-orbit payload mass, that's essentially commercial Leo destinations as a hop, skip, and a jump to somewhere else. And that is, I would say, you're right, there's a different set of questions that go into that, and that set of questions is absolutely gonna depend on the success of companies like iSpace or others that are really harnessing, um, I would say, in-orbit resources for transportation. So it's good to sort of think about it and bucket it in, in different ways, depending upon where you're going. Yeah, so I wanna add on to that, Sita. So the one thing that you did mention in your question, because um, you just said something about propellant, and I was like, oh, I remember having this conversation with an astronaut. <laughs> um, so, you know, there's been talk, oh, there's been a couple. Um, there's been, you know, we've seen studies about propellant depots and either being able to do, you know, the whole bringing it from the moon or maybe just shooting it up into space and having it sitting there ready for you. Um, and I've had this discussion with an astronaut or two, and it always comes down to saying, they've always said, oh, we looked at that back in the 80s. We looked at that back in the 90s. And we had really great technical plans to do it, and it always came down to safety. It was always safety because they said the last thing I want to do is for something to possibly happen with this LOX LH2 exploding and you know removing my crew from the existence. So that's always been the concern. And so I think the real thought is, all right, how can I do that safely without you know possibly endangering my crew, but also be economically viable because I would say with the way that boil off is for those cryogenic systems, you know, after like a month or two, you're gonna be left with like, you know, drip drops of things you can use. So that that's something that, you know, we've thought about for years, but safety and, and the viability of it is what usually just stops it before it even moves too much forward. I'm afraid we have to stop so that the conference doesn't get too far behind. But let's thank our <laughs> panel for a great discussion and thanks for all of you.